Welcome to the Wildverse podcast, where we introduce you to the wild world of taxidermy, a place where artists and hunters collide. I'm Heather. And I'm Ashley. And today we have a super fun episode that I'm very excited about. I know it's one of my favorite episode ideas on one of my favorite podcasts, so I really wanted to incorporate it into our podcast as well. Yes, a trivia episode. I was also looking forward to this one too. Especially after our episode with Daniel, when I know I for sure learned a few new things. Yeah, absolutely. I did too. And it just, you know, you hear these questions and it's always fun to kind of think about what your answer would be and see if you're right. So uh, I thought it would be a fun little short episode that our listeners can have a bit of fun in their own shops or wherever they may be following along with their own answers. We were really hoping this could be a live episode but apparently we have not gained the respect of the Facebook gods yet, so we are not able to go live. Uh, yeah, so meanwhile, y'all who are listening, you can compete against me here at first and see how you score against me. Heather's going to ask me some questions, and I might end up asking her some questions too. So yeah, test your knowledge against us. Yeah, absolutely. It should be a lot of fun. Hopefully we all learn a little bit of something and see if we're maybe as smart as we think we might be. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, let's get started. We are going to begin this episode with a would you rather question. So a would you rather question is always something that's horrible that's followed up with something that's even worse. So here's the one that I came up with that should be relatable to us taxidermists. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> Let me hear it. So uh, would you rather stab yourself with a needle every time you sew like actually legitimately stab yourself you draw blood it always hurts it sucks or would you rather have to skin a gut shot coyote every day oh my gosh (laughs) those are two terrible things either stab myself with a needle every time i sew something or i have to skin a gut shot coyote i'm gonna say skin a gut shot coyote because well is it every day is in like every work day or like 365 day i'm gonna say it's like every work day like you know five days a week one gut shot coyote a day like i start the morning out with skinning a gut shot coyote yep oh that sounds awful um i think i'm gonna choose that one because i would eventually get used to it and i would get really fast at it and then maybe it wouldn't be so bad after a while but stabbing yourself with a needle i mean how much like callus can you build up in order to shield yourself from that needle? (laughs) So I'm going to choose the gut shot coyote. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good pick. I think I'd pick that too. You had some valid points there. I think you're like, you kind of get used to the smell, Um, you know, silver lining as you get really fast at skinning coyotes. Yeah, you'd be a pro. Yeah, exactly. And the whole stabbing yourself, that hurts so bad. I would hate that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it hurts every time and it doesn't get any better. No, we use those like tri-bladed, needles and they cut you and oh I hate I usually slice my fingers with them sometimes yeah I'll pick the gut shot coyote too oh but that's a great question though (laughs) that really makes you think like man those are both awful oh yes I know I know well now I guess we can get into some trivia questions well I did a lot of research on finding some good trivia questions that will relate to taxidermists and outdoorsmen alike in this first episode the topics will be on anatomy conservation taxidermy and general animal knowledge oh man okay (laughs) so this first question fits into the conservation category so here we go roughly how many grizzly bears are there in north america let me set my timer to 20 seconds and your time starts now oh gosh okay let me let me write this down get to thinking how many grizzly bears are in north america Are you counting like grizzly bears and brown bears as one species, or is this only grizzly bears? This is just grizzly bears. Okay, that doesn't really help me anyway, because I don't know. (laughs) Okay, here's my answer. Okay, so is that a 500,000? Yes, that's what I guessed. Okay, you know, you are actually on the right track, but you are wrong. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) what's the answer? (laughs) So there are actually an estimated 50,000 grizzly bears in North America. I meant to say that. (laughs) 
Oh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> well, that's why I had to do- take a double check there at your whiteboard. Yeah. I was like, man, is, there, is that 500 or 50? Yeah, I said 500. Some interesting facts about grizzly bears that I looked up after I had found this little trivia question. So back in 1975, their habitat was actually less than 2% of their original roaming range. Back then, you were not allowed to buy, sell, harm, harass any grizzly bears, and you were not allowed to transfer any grizzly bear parts, you know, hides, claws, skulls, anything other than Montana hunting laws. So apparently back then in Montana, you could still hunt them, but it was less than like 25 bears a year. At what time in history was this? Like what years was this going on? Do you know? That that little fact there was from 1975. Oh, 1975. Okay. Dang, so that wasn't even that long ago. Yeah, no, that wasn't that bad. Like that's kind of when the research somewhat started from what I had found. Um, and then from kind of that point forward, you know, they started reintroducing bears and trying to build up conservation efforts in different little like core areas, like there was like the Yellowstone area, there was like the Northern Continental Divide area, there was a spot up in Idaho, I think that was the Bitterroot area. And there, of course, then was not allowed to be any hunting of any sort. It was federally regulated. They kept trying to, and Yellowstone is the biggest population in the lower 48 at that point back then. Now it's the Northern Continental Divide or or something like that. But an interesting story from 2013 There were some Hutterites, which I don't know if you ever heard of Hutterites. I have not. What is that? So I know people pronounce this different too. So I might be saying it differently than other areas. So Hutterites are almost kind of like, if you ever heard of Mennonites? Oh, okay. Like a religious group? Yes. Yeah, they live in like a colony. There's a lot of them. I know in like North and South Dakota. But anyways, there was this colony in Montana, I think it was, back in 2013. And they had been caught. There were two grizzly bears that were collared. And they said that they chased them off of their land, um, you know, because they were killing livestock and such. And they ended up dying from exhaustion because they were chasing them so far. So they didn't report it, of course, because they were afraid that they would get in trouble because these bears died. So they took their collars off and they tried to smash them and burn them and discard of these collars, which obviously didn't work because they knew where the collars stopped working and that's where they went. They also tried to cremate the bears, which also did not work. Oh, wow. So then they ended up burying them. Yeah. So they got, I think, the highest punishment would have been $25,000 fine per bear and like six months in jail. But they ended up doing some sort of plea deal. They didn't have to do any of that. I don't know what they ended up doing. So that was kind of interesting. So this uh, group, whatever you call them, I guess they're not a vegan organization? No. No, they're (laughs) just like a a different kind of religion. You know, they wanted these bears away because, of course, they run into a lot of human interference i know there is a there is i don't want to say vegan but like an animal rights people that are trying to get hiking kind of like taken away in like glacier because of run-ins with bears they're afraid that this is going to hurt the bear population thought that was kind of interesting oh cause more like bear human interactions i guess they say like the more people in the area means the less bears are going to like mate and reproduce and lower bear numbers I don't know what that's about. Something also that was really interesting was in 2018, that's apparently sometime around where Wyoming and it's either Montana or Idaho opened up some grizzly bear hunting. And they were allowed to take 10 in that core habitat I talked about, and they were allowed to take 12 in other areas. But if one female was killed, no more bears were allowed to be killed. Wow, so that's pretty tight regulations then. Like, they were really monitoring it closely. Yeah. How nervous would you be, though? Like, you'd have to be pretty sure that that is definitely a big bore. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with, like, the regulations as far as now, but I don't think there's any grizzly hunting in the lower 48. Isn't that right? Or is there? I swore that there was something in Montana, but I could be wrong. I honestly couldn't find anything. I think it was recently that they stopped hunting grizzlies up there but actually i'm not sure so we'll have to double check that you might be right because the numbers aren't very large so something that was kind of interesting with two was that in the lower 48 there's only about 1500 grizzlies oh wow that's not very many at all no wonder no especially when the number of estimated in north america is 50,000. so if you had to guess where the largest amount of grizzlies 
were in North America, what would be your guess? In North America? Uh, I would probably say Alaska. Is that not right? You are correct. (laughs) There are approximately 30,000 grizzlies in Alaska alone. Was that a question or is that just a side question? (laughs) No, that was just a little side question. No timer set for that one. (laughs) Dang, I would have had that one right. (laughs) Yes, 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 you would have. That's a little bonus point. (laughs) Yeah. The next question, and this one will fit into the taxidermy category. How much salt do you add per gallon of water when making a basic pickle solution? So I'm going to set the timer. All right, and your time starts now. How much salt do you add per gallon of water when making a basic pickle solution? How? Okay, I hope this is the right one. Because, man, I should know this off the top of my head, like, super easily, but I still had to think about it, so... Okay. I have my answer written down. All right, we're down to about 20 seconds. Okay, so if anyone else out there is listening, you got 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and those people who aren't taxidermists, just take a wild guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just guess something. You might be right. All right, time is up. What was your answer? One pound per gallon is Ashley's answer. Yes, one pound per gallon. And she would be correct. Thank goodness. I was worried if I didn't get that one right. (laughs) This is another kind of little bonus point, but do you know why the salt is important? It draws... No, it doesn't draw out the moisture. It, uh... (sighs) No, please tell me. (laughs) (laughs) So, the salt avoids acid swelling because it helps prevent the hide from sucking in too much I guess moisture because then when you that's all that acid gets in there and then it makes the hide rubbery it doesn't stretch okay so that makes sense I kind of knew that but also kind of didn't so that's good to know well I could tell you were on the right track and then you just weren't exactly sure how to word it. So <laughs> yeah, like I know, I know you were close. Kind of. I'm not a huge uh, tanning person. I can do it. I've done. I was tanning stuff today, but uh, it, my knowledge is slim. Well, there's a lot that could go wrong, so it's always good to read directions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I read the directions every single time. Don't even try to wing it. But yes, I. That is a good idea. Yep. <laughs> because then next thing you know, you ruin something, and then you're out of luck. So now is time for one of the questions that Ashley had gotten together for me to see if I know. Oh, my turn. Okay. Heather, are you ready? I am. Ashley, hold on. Let me pull my timer up so I have a time too. Okay. Okay. I am ready. Here is my question for you. This is multiple choice. So listen carefully, okay? In what year was the first taxidermy competition held? Was it A... 1880, B, 1915, C, 1949, or D, 1960. All right, let me start my timer. All right, read them off to me again. Okay, again, it's A, 1880, B, 1915, C, 1949, or D, 1960. Hmm, is this like the first taxidermy competition in the U.S., in the world? I believe the world. I will double check Mm -hmm. that. I believe just the first documented taxidermy competition, period. Okay. Okay. All right. I got my answer. I don't remember what letter it was, but I'll wait for my time up in case I change my mind. Okay. I got two seconds. All right. (laughs) What is your answer? My answer is whatever letter 1949 was. Ah, so you said C, 1949, and that is incorrect. Ah. The correct answer is 1880. And let me tell you a little bit of a fact about that. So taxidermist William Hornaday became notable in this sport when he won the top prize for a diorama. The scene featuring two male orangutans fighting over a female was awarded for its scientific accuracy. 
And after that, other taxidermists soon took on the challenge of replicating nature in great detail. So just a little blurb about like the competition. It didn't say much, but I'll link the little article that it came from. But yeah, so the first taxidermy competition was in 1880. It might have been like a pretty informal competition, but competition nonetheless. Yeah. I would have guessed, that was, I was going to guess 1880, and then I was like, ah, you know, like, taxidermy was pretty rough back in 1949, let alone <laughs> yeah, 1880. And I was thinking, I don't know if they did competitions that far back. Yeah, it, who knows, huh. you know, how well those orangutans were, like, actually taxidermied, but they were taxidermied nonetheless, and in some kind of competition setting. But yeah, it might have been pretty rough, but but yeah, he won some, you know, quote, awards for it. Yeah, they also might have looked cool. Yeah, actually, maybe we're hating on it. Maybe they actually looked really good. For orangutans, like as cool as orangutans could look, because they're like not the prettiest creatures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're not the most glamorous. No, no, not at all. I got another question for you. Okay, this one. Yes, yes, it was a back-to-back -back Ashley question. Sweet, okay, are you ready, Heather? I am ready. And this question, I don't know exactly what category it goes into. It's an animal question, kind of like your grizzly question. The question is, what are the five species of deer in North America? Oh, let me start my timer. The five species of deer. Okay. Gosh, I'm going to have to write this down. The Always five moves. species of deer in North America. And this is like the five recognized species in North America. There's like a bajillion subspecies but these are recognized as five separate species. I got four. And in order to kill like the North American 29 animals, you have to kill all five of these deer. Deer. I don't know if I'm gonna take a shot in the dark at this one. I don't know if this is considered a deer or not. Hmm. Okay. I think I got my answer. How much time is left? Oh, that is the time. Time is up. All right. What is your answer? The five species of deer in North America. Okay. So I have Sitka, Mule Deer, Whitetail, Blacktail, and Elk. So close. <laughs> so the five species. I feel like I might have some subspecies in there. Kind of. Yeah. So these are kind of like, they're subspecies, but they are recognized as separate species, according to like Boone and Crockett and Big Game Records. And so sometimes they do get into their own category, sometimes not. So maybe it's a little bit of a trick question. But the five species of deer are mule deer, whitetail, coos deer, Sitka blacktail, and Colombian blacktail. Oh, gosh darn it. You know... I thought there was like seek a deer, sick a deer. So that's kind of like, well, I don't, I forgot about those dang coos deer. Gosh darn it. I thought they were, did you say North America? Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay. So that would have been in Mexico. I didn't think about Mexico. Well, they are in Arizona too, I believe, right? Are they? Yeah, they're in Arizona and maybe New Mexico, but for sure Arizona. Yep. You are right. I remember a customer that said that he enjoys hunting the coos deer in Arizona. You are correct. Darn, I am 0 for 2. <laughs> I think, oh, I'm, I'm 0 for 1, right? So I'm not doing that much better. No, no, no. You are 1 for 2. Oh, well then never mind. <laughs> you got your tanning question right and the grizzly question wrong. Okay, now let's see. I think you're up, Heather, to ask the next question. I am, and this question fits into the anatomy category. What is... The scientific name for the furless skin surface surrounding nostril openings. This area is commonly known as the nose pad. Starting the time. Well, what's the scientific name? Oh my gosh, I don't know this. Uh, yes, yes, yes. What? This is a fancy name for it. We just call it the nose pad. Uh, some people call it the nose leather. So this is the like actual name for it oh my god you're gonna stump me okay i know this one's hard i wouldn't know it either <laughs> i'm gonna guess because the only scientific nose situation i know is uh is this one <laughs> okay five seconds oh okay i'm sticking to my answer okay 
Okay, alright, time is up. Alright, what do we got here? I said the Vomero nasal organ. <laughs> I would have known what in the world you wrote down there. Um, <laughs> so I guess that's not right. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'll tell you what this is after you tell me the right answer. <laughs> okay, okay, alright. So the right answer is called the Rhinarium, which in Neo Latin means belonging to the nose. What'd you say it was? It is the Rhinarium. How do you spell that? R H I N A R I U M. Rhinarium. I have never heard that word in my life. So <laughs> that's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. <laughs> When I looked this up, I found an interesting fact about how the nose works, which, you know, it's like people might already like it's an obvious thing. Like, duh, that's how a nose works. But it was kind of interesting when you look at a nose pad, a.k.a. the rhinarium, it is covered with all of these crenulations and nodules and deep lines. And when you really look at them, most of those funnel into the nose. So the whole point of that surface is that it gets wet. It touches whatever it's smelling or just the molecules of pheromones in the air. It attaches to that nose. And then those nodules all funnel that scent down into the nostril itself so they can smell what they're smelling better. Right. Doesn't the nose pad it like secretes whatever in order for scent molecules to stick to it better, basically? And then that smells from there. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of science there. Yeah. I guess I just never thought that all those creases and, and lines and stuff obviously they're there for a purpose, but I never really thought that the purpose is to funnel all that moisture into the nose hole. Does it give it like more surface area in order to get more scent molecules in? Probably. That would make sense. Hmm. That's a good question though. What I said, I said the, what was my answer? The marrow nasal organ. That's the fancy word for the Jacob's gland. Oh, I thought Jacob's gland was a fancy word. So. Oh, <laughs> I not. guess it, there's an even fancier word underneath that one. So, or you can call it the VNO. Okay. Okay. I feel like I might have seen that before. I think you and I have talked about that. So that's where I thought you were going with that. So that's the only scientific uh, nose related word I know. Yeah. I'm not sure many people at home are going to get that one correct, but who knows? <laughs> Some people might surprise me. Yeah. That was a good one. Okay. All right. So this question fits into general animal knowledge with maybe just a little bit of anatomy in there. And also, actually, this one is multiple choice. Okay. So here we go. Which of these wild cats cannot fully retract its claws? A, the serval. B, the cheetah. C, the bobcat. Or D, the ocelot. Timer started. Oh, no. Uh, I do not know this. I'm just going to guess, and I'm going to give it my best shot. Okay, I'm going to repeat your choices again, just in case anybody needs them for a second time. Okay, yes, please. <laughs> we have A, Serval, B, Cheetah, C, Bobcat, and D, Ocelot. Which of these wild cats cannot fully retract its claws? All right, we're counting down. Three, two, one, and that is time. B, cheetah is Ashley's answer. Yes. And Ashley, you would be correct. Oh, no way. Yep, that was a good guess. <laughs> I I had a feeling. I, my my uh, reasoning was that the other three cats are more like swifty, you know, they're, they're climbing stuff a lot. And the cheetah, you know, their big thing is running. So it kind of was an outlier there. So I chose that one. Well, that was definitely a good thought process because that is the reason that they do not have retractable claws. So a um, little fun fact is their foot anatomy is actually exactly the same as every other cat. So they kind of have the ability, you know, the claw does move, but they do not have the sheath that covers the claw. Oh, okay. I wonder, does that have anything to do with like their speed? Like maybe their claws don't retract all the way to get more traction? I don't know. I'm just, uh, what's the word? Hypothesizing. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. You would think pressure on the foot would keep the claws out anyways, but maybe it does help with traction and that is why they're faster, among other things. 
but yeah, it had stated that they don't climb trees, so they don't need. It kind of makes you question what's the point of having retractable claws. Like, why aren't they just out there all the time? <laughs> that is a good question. Like, what's the benefit? You ever get clawed by a cat, like a house cat or something? And when they sink their claws and it's like, they're stuck almost. So them being able to retract, you know, maybe they're stuck and they can't even get them out until they retract. It's like, it's such a hook that they need to be able to retract to get themselves unstuck. That might be it. That's just a theory again. I don't know. I, I guess, but then I think... How does the sheath come into play with that? Yeah, so I don't know either. You know, because I think it's just the shape of the claws because they are so hooked downwards. But uh, yeah, that is why they do not have a sheath over their claw. And they are the only wild cat that is that way. So now, Ashley, you have one final question for me from you. All right, my next question. Okay, this one, I suspect will be a little bit easier for at least you, Heather. We shall see Okay. how you do. Okay. The question is, what's the most common eye size for deer? Oh. Like when you are taxiderming a deer, what is the most common eye size? That one is easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me start my time. Oh, man. I just well, don't know. For a person I just don't who know. doesn't taxidermy a lot of deer, <laughs> it might be a tricky question. However, a person who yeah, yeah, it could be does mount deer, they should know this. So, yes, what is the most common eye size for deer? Yeah, when you first said eye size, at first I was like, oh no. Like, sometimes I get mixed up. Like, when it comes to red fox, bobcats, coyotes, like, all that stuff, I always have to look. But deer... I do know. So if I get this one wrong. Yeah, so if you get it wrong, then. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Take my taxidermy license. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Time is up. All right. My answer is 32 millimeters. 32 millimeters is correct. You got it. So that is the most common eye size for deer. 32 millimeters. Oh, oof. Oof. <laughs> you got it. Good. I almost thought you were going to say I was wrong and then I'd make a complete idiot out of myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I got you. <laughs> so yes, 32 millimeters. It's the most common eye size and anyone who mounts, you know, maybe more than 10 deer a year probably knows that one. Yeah. It's very rare. You get a 28 millimeter or a 30 millimeter, you know, does or really, really small bucks. You know, it's kind of rare to have to use those. Or a 34 millimeter. I think I've used those on like fairly big animals like maybe a big mule deer or something but i mean even then you can use a 32 millimeter in like okay. anything because you can size up or size down even if it does call for something else yeah a little bit of carving out or adding in or whatever yes. seems to work all right i know we use 36 a lot but i don't know if i've ever i'm sure i've used a 34 but i don't know if i've ever really used one are you using that for like elk the 36s yeah yeah elk kudu I'm not sure if the Cape Buffalo take 36 or not, but I know elk and like kudu definitely use them. I think I just bought some 38s, I want to say, for that longhorn cow. Okay. They're either 38 or 36, but they're big eyes. That's like the biggest ones I was able to get, I think. They do have large eyes. I know every day I go out in the pasture and I look at the cows and their eyes are like bulging out of their head. Yeah. If I mounted a cow that looked like that, it'd look really rough. <laughs> yeah, so... Try to give it a soft look. Yeah, you don't want it to look like its eyes falling out of the socket. Like they sometimes do in real life. They just look just protruding. Right. <laughs> okay, last question for the episode. I thought this one should be a taxidermy related question. So here it goes. If your two-part plastic that you use for molding and casting happens to freeze, can you still use it when it thaws? Start. So this is like a yes or no question? So if it freezes... Can you still use it? Yes. Is it junk or is it still usable? Well, I am simply guessing. I don't know this for sure. So either way, I'm going to learn something. And I used some yep. of this today, so... This will be very handy to know because I think this stuff did freeze. And so if this didn't if this didn't work, it's setting up right now. So it might not have actually cured. I don't know. So we'll see. 
Yeah, that's a fine out. All right, time is up. So, the answer, Ashley said yes, and the actual answer is yes. You can still use it. Thank goodness. <laughs> so, according to Smooth On Products is where I got this info, because I wasn't sure either. Um, the two parts, they just must be thawed and then thoroughly mix each part before using it. That's interesting. I would have never even considered that as something to worry about. But now, knowing that it's okay, I won't have to worry about that. Because I just used some of this today, like I said, and it was down like in part of my house that it does freeze. And it has been so cold that I think it did freeze a little bit or like got almost to freezing. And so I pulled it out today and used it. I poured it and I still have to go check that. So I was really hoping the answer was yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would have said nope it's junk throw it out ashley's like gosh darn it they just ruined that mold <laughs> i know that would have ruined my plans huh well that's a good question though. yeah yeah i i did not know that one either and i was trying to think like what's a good taxidermy related question and so i looked that up and smooth on that's the info they had because i've always thought you know what if what if you order some and it it's out in your mailbox and you didn't realize it and it sits out there overnight and you live where it's really cold. Like, is it junk now or can you still use it? Hopefully that comes in handy for somebody. Right. Like if you have it setting in your garage or if your shop freezes, that's good to know for storage. I mean, I'm sure you're supposed to store it in like a room temperature environment, right? Yeah. But of course that's not realistic all the time. No, no. Sometimes stuff happens. So it's nice to know when that stuff happens, if you are still in good shape or not so much. Yes. So I think you asked me how many questions? Heather, you asked me five questions. I got three of them right. And I asked you three questions. You got one of them right. So we asked eight questions total. So, so how did y'all do? Did you guys beat us or not? Yeah, I mean, I definitely was a loser on this one. I really am upset about that no. deer question. I should have known that. <laughs> I maybe should have worded it differently, too. Well, you know, I don't think if you would have worded it any differently, I would have remembered Coos deer. They just, I completely forgot about them. I do maybe one okay. a year, so <laughs> completely forget about them. Okay, so that's fair. <laughs> It was a fun little episode. We both got to learn a little bit about different stuff. And I know I even just learned coming up with these questions. So we're hoping that we'll make this a once a month little short fun episode for everybody to hopefully play along. And that wraps up this month's trivia episode. We hope you all enjoyed following along and taking your best guesses. We would like to thank you for listening to our new podcast, Wildverse. If you would like to stay up to date on new episode releases, you can follow us on Facebook at Wildverse Taxidermy Podcast or at Instagram at Wildverse Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Wildverse Podcast, to see when new videos come out. Or you can check out Wildverse on podbean.com to listen from your favorite apps. And don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen from. Yes, we hope you have a great week and learn something new. I sure did. Bye.